Well, the fact that they're presenting it as a tax break for the middle class. I just got a report from the Minnesota tax commissioner shows that uh, 450,000 Minnesotans are going to get a middle class Minnesotans are going to get a tax increase. Uh, 320,000 um, taxpayers are going to lose the deductibility for the interest on their student loans. Um, there's another uh, 900,000 that are going to pay uh, increased taxes for losing the deductibility of their state and uh, uh, income and, and, and sales taxes. So the, 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 the tr and the Congressional Budget Office concluded that um, anybody making uh, $70,000 uh, or, or less is going to get a, a tax increase. So if you're in the middle class, you know, you might so there might be someone in the middle class that's going to get a break. But if, if they do, it would be enough to buy the hubcap on a Mercedes-Benz. Meanwhile, the upper 1% is getting a $1.5 trillion tax cut. And uh, they don't need it. Um, as one of my colleagues said, you know, this ain't trickle-down economics. Uh, this is just give me the cash, give me the money. And, and they're running away with it. And they're passing a terrible, terrible uh, equal amount of debt onto the uh, future generations. It's unconscionable and it's a bad, bad public policy. And I think we'll rue the day that it was ever passed. And hopefully it won't be passed by the time we're all done with all the co considerations here. Well, you know, almost all of the good legislation that's occurred in America, whether it be uh, Social Security that lifted more people out of poverty than perhaps anything that's ever done, or Medicare, uh, which uh, brought uh, health care to seniors and doubled their life expectancy, those were all bipartisan. And uh, when one party, you know, uh, because they have a majority, insists on their way, it's usually not very good. And uh, that's just the history of these things. And uh, business has been doing just fine under the existing tax laws. We're see the, seeing the accumulation of wealth unparalleled uh, anywhere in human history. The, the economy is, is uh, going along nicely. The only thing that's wrong with it is, is that, um, as one person said to me, it's a good thing the new economy has created millions of jobs because you need two or three of them to make a living. And uh, historically here, uh, you know, in, in our generations, you could make a good living with one job. And that's what we need to get back to. Uh, people put in uh, uh, eight hours, uh, 40 hours a week, maybe a little overtime from time to time. They should be able to uh, have an income from that. It'll allow them to live modestly, comfortable, comfortably. And, uh, and to be able to not have to worry about health care and pension benefits. And that's what we got to get back to. I got involved in the pension issue with regard to the central state's multi-employer pension plan, of which a significant number of Minnesotans were involved with. There were 16,000 companies and uh, uh, over 470,000 retirees involved in that plan. And they entered into contracts where the workers agreed to pay in X number of dollars, the companies agreed to pay in X number of dollars, the workers' contributions came out of every paycheck. So they honored every dollar that they agreed to to contribute to their pension plans. The businesses could be counted on at some point later to put their share in. Guess what? Um, 13,000 of the 16,000 companies never put their money in. Okay, so the fund is short, and uh, um, and the congressional solution was to just gut and cut the pensioners' funds. That's not right. They played by the rules. They put their money in. They were counting on that. At 65 or 70, it's a little late to change your careers. So, and and what's so egregious and important about this is this is just the eye of the storm. Um, there are hundreds of other pension funds. Uh, that are in the same kind of trouble because businesses, counties, cities, states didn't put in the money that they had contracted for. So there are literally millions of people who thought they had a pension or counting on a pension who aren't going to have one unless we fix this. And that's what this legislation is, is the legislation to uh, make sure that every pensioner gets every dollar that they had uh, uh, contracted for in their pension plans in their retirement years. Well, um, um, I'm hopeful.
I'm hopeful. It's got good support, uh, I know, uh, among the various sponsors of it, Senator Jared Brown from uh, Ohio and Bernie Sanders and uh, myself and others over on the, on the House side. We're certainly going to push very, very hard uh, for this resolution. And it's really not going to cost the taxpayers. Um, you know, our solution is to put together a bonding uh, program where the pensioners could be able to get their pensions and then uh, with the hope that growth in the economy will uh, get the funds you know, back up to where they need to be during the interim period of time. And if necessary, uh, we'll have to put some uh, treasury funds into that. You know, we, um, we, uh, we, we spend, uh, you know what, we spend six trillion in just Iraq and uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and for a small portion of that, we could fix the pensions in this country. For a small portion of that, we could uh, graduate, we could retire all the student debt in this country. You know, for a small portion of that, we could find cures for cancer or Alzheimer's or diabetes. And we could still have four or five trillion dollars left over for debt reduction. Well, first of all, I uh, belong to a uh, problem solvers uh, bipartisan caucus and we've advanced uh, a number of proposals that we think would be helpful in fixing things that are uh, need fixing under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Senator Murray and uh, Senator Alexander uh, one a Democrat and the other Republican are working with that on the Senate side and we're hope we, hopeful we can put some fixes uh, in there for that. But the simple truth with regard to the bill that was passed by the House of Representatives you know, is, is that it would put 25, 30 million people on the streets without insurance. And uh, by the way, they had a Rose Guard celebration uh, with the President uh, Trump when that was passed and then the next day he came out and called it a mean bill. <laughs> Why? Well, because it's going to put uh, 25, 30 million people on the streets without insurance, people with pre-existing conditions. Um, put people into bankruptcy because of health cares and policies that um, uh, have limits on how much they have to pay. And uh, what the President is saying um, and what they're saying is we're going to give everybody a cheap policy, but then the bills they're producing uh, eliminates the requirement for essential services. And <laughs> essential services under the law include hospitalization, pharmaceuticals, emergency room care, uh, preventive care, uh, care for pre-existing conditions, uh, removing the limits on how much insurance company could pay. Well, yeah, you can, <laughs> if your insurance policy doesn't cover any of that, you can get a hell of a cheap policy uh, and all it'll cover the executive uh, insurance company executive salaries. But you better not get sick or have an accident because they don't cover anything. Well, I think at the moment uh, we're feeling pretty good about it. Um, you know, I had served in the 70s, took a little 32-year hiatus, and I've been in the last uh, three election cycles. And uh, you know when the wind is in your face and the wind is at your back. And um, I, I think the tax policy uh, that the Republicans have pursued uh, uh, is very egregious, and uh, people are going to be aware of that. The budget policies and spending policies they pursued um, are very egregious. They've called for gutting of funding of everything from the municipal waste treatment facilities to uh, funding for uh, the National Institute of Health, the sciences, the arts, uh, um, infrastructure, um, and then their effort to throw 30 million people out of the streets on, on insurance. Uh, people are aware. Um, they are uh, much more uh, active and, uh, and wanting to do something about it than I've seen in a long time. Now things can change between now and, and uh, next November, but I, I don't see them changing much because these, these uh, tax policies, spending policies, health care, they, they run deep and people are deeply concerned and uh, the polling shows that um, uh, the Democrats uh, have a pretty substantial lead when they, uh, people are asked who they intend to vote for in the next election. Um, I think that's a good decision uh, on his part for a wide variety of reasons. He uh, acknowledged uh, in his statement that the Democrats have better candidates and uh, that the Republicans have a bad message and uh, weak candidates and it's not a good time for a Republican to be running for public office.
Well, a couple things. First is uh, sexual harassment and uh, sexual assaults uh, cannot be allowed or tolerated under any circumstances. And I'm glad that uh, he's apologized uh, for that behavior. Um, and I'm glad that he's uh, called for a congressional investigation. So, uh, you know, that, that is, is number one. Beyond that, you know, I think there's a bill in the Congress now. I don't think there is a bill in the Congress now to require mandatory uh, sexual harassment training uh, for members of Congress and, and for their staff. Uh, the simple truth is, is that culture and times and things change. And in this case, uh, the change and the need for change is profound. And uh, everybody has to realize and understand, you know, how important this is. I'm the father of two uh, uh, young women, and I have a, a number of, of, of uh, female uh, grandchildren. And I don't, under any conditions or any circumstances, will I tolerate uh, any uh, sexual harassment of them. Um, and God forbid the perpetuator uh, of, a, of an aggressive sexual act against them. Neither one of them are allowable or tolerable, and uh, we have to do everything we can to stop it.